Atenção, atenção. Yes, dear listener, that can only mean one thing. You're listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. The linguistically talented amongst you um, will have recognised that atenção, atenção is, of course, Portuguese for achtung, achtung. Yes, it is. <laughs> and we haven't chosen to start with such a beautiful language just to be clever, have we? No, not on this occasion. Our first topic today will be Brazilian-themed, but more of that in a minute. First, a reminder of the rules of this podcast. James and I will talk about anything to do with the Second World War, often digressing massively. We may at times talk about things of enormous importance. And we may also talk absolute trivia. Uh, Adolf Hitler's bollock featured Rob heavily last week. It certainly did. It's weighing on my mind still. Note the singular. But... The right-hand bollock. But the key to the show is as much interaction with you, our infantry division of listeners, as possible. Indeed. So keep your questions coming in on Twitter using the hashtag WeHaveWays. Now, one or two of our older listeners have suggested that interacting on social media is not necessarily their preferred method of correspondence. In which case, feel free to email us at wehavewayspodcast at gmail.com. And there if you want go. snail mail, well, you know, there is an alternative, I'm small. Yeah, yeah, d- 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 no. yeah, I mean... Sorry. You know, email really is for old people these days, isn't it? Let's be honest now. Um, before <laughs> we go any further, let's start with this fabulous question from Matt is Unarmored. That's his name. Hi, Alan James. I read a while ago, I think about Monte Cassino, about a Brazilian force fighting in Italy for the Allies. It's the first I'd heard of it, which is what I love about learning about World War II. Do you know any more about this? Now, I didn't know much about this until we... Uh, said we were going to talk about this. <laughs> what a story. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. So the Brazilians are, well, it, it, it all goes back to kind of economics, of course, and um, trade partners with the United States, which is very important yeah. to Brazil. Um, and um, in 1941... Um, now, before you get in, did Brazil take part in the First World War? Yes, but in a kind of non-combatant way. I right. think they were on the other side in the First World War, if I remember rightly. Yeah, I, I, you see, I don't, I, I just don't know. I think the they were. I think they were. Okay. I think they were, were, were on the other side. Anyway, um, but anyway, um, they, to, we, if we're wrong, let us know. Yeah, let but us anyway, nineteen forty-one. Anyway, so nineteen forty-one, they sign out that the there's a, the Brazilian US um, sort of um, make a little sort of deal, a kind of trade deal, yeah. uh, a defense strategy is basically what they do. Yeah. Um, and what's happening is that America is sort of being drawn into the Battle of the Atlantic from the middle of nineteen forty-one onwards. Um, so way before Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Uh, and there is the very famous sinking of the Reuben James, which is a U.S. destroyer, which is sunk by Eric Topp in yeah. his his U boat, and which Woody Guthrie writes a folk song about. Um, and um, and so they are in the kind of war effectively. Uh, and what happens in the early 1942, once America is in the war, is that suddenly there is the second happy time for the U boat crews. This is the slaughter off the Americas. Yeah. And what's happening is the Americans, um, neither the Americans or, or South Americans, have got themselves into any kind of um, convoys. So they're just doing single. Uh, sailings and single sailings are better because you can then stagger when you arrive at the port. You don't have a massive, big load of ships all turning up at the same time, which clogs yeah. your stevedores and your yeah. whole, you know. So, so it's safer being in convoy, but it comes with its own hassles. So they continue with the uh, single sailing thing, thinking they're going to be fine, but they're not because the U boats have worked out how to kind of stay at sea longer. Uh, and basically, there is this second slaughter, and lots of Brazilian ships and indeed zillions of American ships get get sent to the bottom. Yeah. Um, and so the Brazilians think, oh, hang on a minute, this isn't very good. Um, um, and on top of that, the Americans are kind of leaning on them very, very heavily to get involved. You know, if you come in on the war, you yeah. know, we'll we'll make it worth your while, mate, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, they promised them a steelworks and all that sort of thing. All yeah. that kind yeah, of stuff, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and so they declare war on the, I think it's the 22nd of August, 1942. Yeah, but, but they don't have an army, do they? Pro- proper... Proper army. Well, they've got a bit of an army. So, yeah. so they, they, they then have to put, but they put, but, the, but basically the Americans say to them, we'll kick you out. Yeah. We'll get you there. We'll, we'll kind of, you'll be a sort of adjunct to the, yeah. to the American army. And I, 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 read, I mean, last night read about this guy who, uh, a, a, a Brazilian uh, media mogul called Chateau Briand, who offered to pay for the army himself because the government then got its finger out. Because I think one in seven uh, Brazilian uh, naval personnel were killed in the, um, in the sinkings. And the government had tried to stay out. And in, and in fact, it was public pressure that brought brought Brazil into the war because they they were outraged at all these deaths. Yep. 
which is really, really, yeah. really, and, and, really fascinating. And, was Brazil- and, you know, they also allowed the Americans to have um, air bases and Brazilian soil yeah, on the yeah. coast. The Brazilian Air Force was also operating and doing kind of anti-shipping operations yeah. and stuff off the Brazilian coast, South, South American coast. Um, the Navy, the Brazilian Navy, was playing a really important part in the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, and, you know, as you say, you know, suffered for it as a result. But the Smoking Cobras. The Smoking Cobras, yeah. Well, this is a Brazilian division of 25,000 men who who go over and join the US Fifth Army and in Italy. And their logo is actually a cobra with a pipe isn't it yeah so the origins of the smoking cobras is is we have a phrase called you know when pigs might fly oh yeah. it's never going to happen they they have one snakes might smoke uh, uh, you <laughs> know that yeah. they would ever see action right so anyway they're sent to the they're sent to the uh, sent to italy and they're not there in, in monte cassino they, they come come later so what happens is 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 the um the allies win battle of uh, operation diadem which is the battle for rome and then a whole load of divisions get taken away from yes. the uh, allied armies and in sent italy to south of france sent to and, south of france yeah, yeah, so yeah. they've suddenly yeah. got these huge gaps and this is where the brazilians come in so they kind of you know they come and do this uh, the slot into the line and they're they're put on a kind of pretty weak part of the line so they're up against kind of low grade german division the 148th division yeah. um, and also a couple of kind of Mussolini's new um, new Italian divisions which are absolutely useless and um, uh, but they perform really quite well I mean yeah. you know they, they do alright I mean you know they're, they're 13... Oppo, and they have this amazing shoulder patch which, which is, is, which is, which is a, a cobra smoking a pipe and they take 13,000 prisoners right at the end of the war do they? they do take they yes. capture a lot of people and quite disrupt the sort of final German manoeuvres yeah so they, they get so they're, they're they're strategic, signi- op- or strategically or strategically significant achievements and and because uh, when they got the army t- to theater they realized they hadn't trained them and they didn't have any equipment and they had to be trained in the they had to be trained in the rear in as it were in in italy um uh actually taught how to operate within a, within the american tactical and operational framework didn't they i mean it, yeah it, absolutely so from scratch which is pretty extraordinary really yeah, and they they do do pretty well. I mean, yeah. they 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 don't disgrace themselves by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, they're not really you know. So they're in a holding position in the kind of sort of autumn and winter of nineteen forty four forty five, and then Mark Clark, who by that time is a kind of commander in chief of Allied yeah. armies in Italy, he then launches his main offensive in whenever it is middle of March nineteen forty five. And that's where they play a part. And they're 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 pushing against kind of sort of a weak end of the line. Yeah. Um, but as I say, they you know they they do pretty well. And they do play their part. So they play their their part on on land, in the air, and on sea. And you know it just underlines why it's called a world war. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. But they're the only the only South Africa South American nation to take part. Yeah, yeah. Um, when Africa they got was. home though, were they heroes? Because uh, I don't know. You see, that's if if someone knows about, I don't know. I because because there, the, you know, if you consider the, uh, uh, and maybe we'll talk about Ireland in a minute. But when you talk, consider the people who fought for 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 uh, the British Empire, who were Irish, yeah, one hundred sixty thousand of them, right? What happened to them when they got home? They didn't yeah, get home. They, they, you know, they then had a very rough ride when they got home. What uh, were did the Brazilians re- return to land fit for God, heroes just, and all I that? It's a know. fascinating. I don't know. Or did they end up turning into a military caste that then became part of Brazilian politics and, you know, the tail wagging the dog and all that sort of thing? Because because they'd had a, if the Brazilians had had a sort of effective military government in the 30s, which is why, after all, they weren't necessarily keen on on getting involved in the Second World War because they were quite fascist, <laughs> you know, birds of a feather, you know. So, I mean, it'd be interesting. If anyone knows, please let us know. Hashtag we have ways or email us. We have ways podcast at gmail.com if you're old. And I'm going to look into that as well. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, excellent. Now um, we've questions. Uh, Tony Rhodes writes, given the disaster of the Powell's battalions in the First World War, how much effort was concentrated into ensuring conscripts were spread about the military in general or local county regiments, e.g. the Dorsetshires? Well, I mean, you know, in the 1930s, the recruiting base was your kind of, you know, you would, if you wanted to kind of join... A regiment, you would go to the local county town and you, you'd yeah. join up. I mean, you know, we, we've been chatting about Headley Verity, the famous um, Yorkshire and England bowler, yeah, who joins up and he joins up the Green Howards, which is his local Yorkshire regiment, and that's because he knows the colonel and yeah. it's his local one. Yeah. What you find by as the war progresses is that people get more and more split up. 
So, you know, you go to a, you know, you go and do your training and then you're spread to another, you're not going to a local recruitment yeah. depot. You sign on the dotted line. It's not for a local battalion or anything. It's just the army and then you get distributed. So yeah. in the, you might have the Cornwall Light Infantry, which might have guys from Scotland and uh, you might have the Cameron Highlanders, which yeah. has got guys from, from well, Cornwall my, and Dorset. My, my grandfather, who was in the Bucks Battalion, which was a territorial battalion yeah. out of Marlow, um, which is Ox and Bucks Light Infantry, but, you know, you know, these territorial adjuncts to the regimental battalions. One professional soldier in the battalion who's the sergeant major, everyone else, TA, um, they were all from... They, they was, that was Butcher Baker Candlestick Maker. He was a stockbroker. He was from, you know, and, and the officers were stockbrokers and lawyers and the, and the men were everyone else. And, uh, and they were all from Marlow. And then I remember talking to a guy on D-Day who was Yorkshire Rifles, one of the Yorkshire Rifle Battalions, who was from Mitcham in, in, near Croydon. Um, because by 1944, like you say, you got, you got put into the mincer and they turned the handle and you'd come out wherever. And, and, and uh, uh, George MacDonald Fraser's uh, quarter safe out, safe out here. He's in a Cumbrian battalion with, with Cumbrians. And some Geordies, who are sort of like space aliens to the Cumbrians, even though like we look at it from the, south the other side of the, just the other side of the, yeah, exactly. But 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 what you do have this local regiment thing. But gradually, as you say, it sort of gets yeah, you because know, people get sent wherever. I mean, the, and the other, I mean, the other thing I think is really interesting about, um, I mean, about who's in the army by 1944 is it's people from service industries. It's people who work in shops. It's not people from industry because they've got reserved employment. So yeah. if you're a factory worker, if you, so it tends to, or a farmer, it's everyone from all the in-between jobs. So it's, it's, it's people who work in shoe shops and it's, um, uh, uh, people who work in libraries and v- it, it, yeah and this is exactly it, the problem the Germans have is that they take all the people out of the factories by yeah. the end of 1941 because they've suddenly you know they've, they've suffered such huge casualties in yeah. Barbarossa and in them fighting up to that point and so they've got to replace those factory workers with someone else and so that's where that's the slave labour comes labor, we were talking about last year yeah. but just go back to the whole powers thing I mean the point about the powers battalions is, is it was you it was designed so that you could join up as mates together so mm. from your own all the same workplace or from the same village or whatever it be. And what what tends to happen by the Second World War is you never have that again. That's not repeated. So you might be from Wiltshire, you might be from Dorset, but you're not going to be from the same school, the same com- you know, the same factory. You, no. you get mixed up again so that you don't have this kind of devastation of entire communities yeah. in one go. That's yeah, the but, the, but, but a lot of that's due to the lessons learned from the First World War. Absolutely, the, yeah. The army's going, well, we, we, we won't get away with that again. <clears throat> I mean, and politically, and and uh, uh, the army knows we, we, there's a whole load of things we can't that we did last time we can't do again. So I got a question from Simon Kovach who says, "Loving the podcast, thanks, chaps. Uh, thank you, Simon. Thank you. Uh, just wondered why the Germans did not really use special forces like the Allies did. Oh, yeah, it's an interesting one. Well, they, they did. A bit. Oh, Falschirm Jäger. Come on, Eben Ebel. That's that's special forces. That's the that's yeah, the, that's so. probably the that's probably the earth father of all special ops. Yeah, but he's um, thinking sort of commandos and SAS and SBS, I suppose, isn't yeah, it? I suppose. But um, you know, you've got you've got Scorzani and, uh, yeah. and all those sort of fruitcakes. But you don't have anyone doing that in the Western Desert apart from the SAS and LRPG. No, I mean that is interesting because you because you do have the SAS and and you know, in, in raiding airfields with varying degrees of competence and success. Yeah. The Germans sort of aren't doing that, are they? But and actually, they... the Italians have the Dachima Mass as well. Right, okay. Yeah, which is equivalent to the SBS. Right. So so they are doing it, but, yeah. but not on the kind of... Not the same, quite the same not, level. Not quite the same level. But but is this a bit of Victor's history, though? Because if the would we, if the Germans had won, would there be all the stories of these daring raids and all that sort of thing that, that, that they carried out? Yes, because I suppose the fact that you're launching a daring raids in the first place is because you've... Got no you know, options. You've got no other I mean, options. So, you know, yeah. until, until Dieppe, where there's a bit where something big happens. Yes. Right. That we've got no options. So it's the odd. It's the you know. It's the odd. You yeah. Know, and if you want to do those kind of raids, those special raids, you've got to have a force that is trained to do those special exactly. raids. So yeah. you, then you yeah. create the commandos. Yeah. yeah. So you, yeah. So you have some commandos who sort of, you know go to the Channel Islands or something. Yeah. And because the Americans don't have the SBS either. No, no, they don't. Or bother. SAS or anything. No, or the, ra- the Rangers are seen as sort of. Well, the Rangers are kind of yeah, but they they become more and more as the as the war develops. They yeah. become like a, just an extra kind of. They're like the equivalent of sort of land based airborne troops. Yeah. 
Yeah. Are they volunteers? Are yeah. a bit more motivated than most? You, because the thing is, you think but, you think in it, because Ger- German military culture did operate a hero culture. So you know, we yeah. talked about Whitman at, at Bovington, and and they did an ace an ace culture, and they very much did. And you would create these heroes, and or, or these heroes would emerge through the structure, and the party would pat them on the back, and they'd go and they'd go and have coffee with Hitler or whatever. I think he probably had def- decaf, but the but the, but the, the you know the, they did that. Yeah. So it's it's it is quite interesting that they didn't have you know like cr- crack super Nazi commandos who were you know that they didn't do in a, in a strange way that the eagles landed wasn't the sort of thing they'd do where they'd have a crack bunch of people try and uh, capture Churchill or whatever you know that, that it's been left to fiction to yeah. to, to and I suppose also they did have the Waffen SS which was kind of designed to be they're not special forces but they were designed to be kind of you know you poster volunteer boy, poster boy poster boy volunteer. Yeah, you know yeah, these yeah. are the ones where you have that I mean because if you think about the special forces what 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 do special forces troops have in common well the volunteers, yeah. uh, they're highly motivated. They can think on their feet. They can use all that kind of yeah. abstract tactic, mission yeah. command bollocks that everyone goes yeah, obsessed yeah, yeah. about. Um, they, they can do all those sort of things. And all that stuff makes you better because you're just so much more motivated to yeah. do well. Yeah. Whereas the vast majority of troops in World War II are conscripts, yeah. don't want to be there, yeah. just want to be led, keep yeah. their head wanted, down. And want it to end. And want it to end. And want, and want to, yeah, yeah, and keep their head down and keep yeah. out of trouble. But it sounds to me, though, that one the first set of people you're describing are very very expensive and the second set of people probably do the job without costing quite so much money and it yeah. may be that it's the germans being so strapped that they don't you know you've got a russian front front to to plug you haven't got time to to have blokes tooling around in speedboats or in the highland you know the, the, the commando training i mean that's the, the interesting thing i mean you know about airborne soldiers is for all the training they spend very little time in theater re- relatively speaking mm. you know um first airborne First Airborne are in North Africa for, you know, the first parachute brigade are in North Africa for a few weeks. Then they do, they're in Sicily yeah. for a couple of weeks. They're in Italy for a couple of weeks. That's it. Yeah. And compared to like a, to, compared to your bog stand, your Durham's, your, your, oh your Green God. Howard's, you, Durham's, you, you, yeah. you, you know, to your bog standard regiments, they're really not, you, you could argue, and, you know, and I, I'll get in trouble when I get home because my father wore a red beret. Um, they don't pull their weight. <laughs> they're incredibly expensive, expensive to train, to maintain, to take, to, to, to use operationally. And well, you, yeah, actually, it's the same with the Rangers in the, uh, know, and the and the two airborne divisions in it, Normandy. It, exactly. You know, you think 101st are out by what, 13th, 14th of June, something yeah. like that? I think the 82nd are out by the like the 18th of June? Yeah, and six airborne. And the Rangers, come, they do, once they've got the Maisie battery and all that, that's, yeah. they're done. Yeah, and six airborne are out by the start of August, I think, but just, just before the, 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 they do their own mini breakout. Um, in northern Normandy, but but they're out, and then you know, yeah. r- 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 and they they get their they get their replacements and everything, and then they they appear in the Ardennes, and then they're taken out again, and 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 you know, I think when six airborne end up going to the Baltic, it's all a bit of an indignity that they're a light line infantry again. So the the the, the thing with special forces is. Of course, they're sort of they're sort of magnetic as an idea, and they're interesting, and they're and and you get these tales of daring do, but it, but but they're expensive. They're possibly surplus to requirements. How effective are they really? Yep. And you've got all your bog standard infantry who've, you know, this is the famous story of the guards arriving at Arnhem and the blokes saying to the guards, where the fucking hell have you been? And and uh, I've been here nine days, mate. And the guardsman goes, I've been here since June. <laughs> where the fuck have you been? And that's a p- paraphrased version of events. But anyway. Well, and there's that whole other issue with um, airborne troops is that, you know, they're among the best trained troops delivered by the least trained air crew and, yeah. you know, the whole problems that comes with that. You know, they've developed this airborne arm without really thinking through how they're actually going to get these yeah. guys to the battle zone. Yeah. You know, there is not a British-designed airborne yeah. transport plane. Yeah, because the RAF won't have it. The RAF don't believe in it. Yeah. Right. Podrick Reedy asks, Hello, Podrick. He's a friend of mine. Um, uh, uh, that does, doesn't does just mean that friends listen to this podcast, by the way. All sorts of people do rate it, um, subscribe. Would giving the Allies access to the Irish treaty ports really have made that much difference to the course of the war? Hmm. Now, that's a fascinating question because Ireland, of course, was neutral. Yes. Um, after 1922, it was after the no, Republic yeah. of Ireland. Yeah, the free Ira, state. The free state, yeah. Um, and no longer no longer tied to the British Empire. Yeah, and despite and, repeated efforts to try and get the Irish to kind of be at least a friendly neutral, yep. um, De Valera was having absolutely none of it and, whatsoever. And supposedly sort of offers of you can have the North if you come in and all that sort of uh, 
that, yep. that those kind of overtures. Absolutely washed straight over him, wasn't having. Yeah, he was not all. interested. No, um, and 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 yet Dublin is attacked by the Luftwaffe at one point. There were there were, right, there were a couple of um, and you know the Luftwaffe said oh, we thought it was Glasgow or whatever. I yeah. mean, yeah, right. <laughs> they're, they're similar cities, <laughs> ports from the nineteenth century built by the British. But I mean, it, it's, an, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because because there was there was considerable kind of pressure to try and get to get Ireland to, to, to free open, to open the ports. And you could think in terms of the Battle Atlantic, it, you, you're that leapfrog closer to where the Battle Atlantic's being yep. fought. You could, you've got more, arguably more control of the entry to the Atlantic uh, or the entry to the, entry to the channel, depending on your point of view. Yeah. Not, mu- not many but big no, ports no, on the West Coast, are there? But, but it puts a couple of hundred miles on the range of, a, of an aircraft. So if, you, yep. if, you've, if you've got a, a, you know, a plane with a searchlight... That's now, where it would have been really. If, if we that, could have that's, had, that's the massive. That's we, actually the big difference. Rather it's than less the, ports. It's, it's, it's less it's ports. Airfields. It's airfields. Yeah. And presence. You know, it's yeah. another big. It's a massive training area as well. Yeah. You know, in the build up towards D Day from kind of 1942 onwards, yeah. Operation Bolero. You know, build up yeah. of US forces in the United Kingdom. You know, if you'd managed to actually put them in in Ireland as well and have them training in Ireland, that would have been a huge help. Yeah. You know, but but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's about the airfields, as I think, is more important than the ports. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, it, Irish neutrality is such a. You know, it, it, and Podrick knows this perfectly well. It's a fantastic can of worms that we've managed to get the lid back onto. Right. Um, <laughs> Brian Williams asks, um, why German intelligence in World War Two was so consistently bad? Um, that was a question I was going to ask you and James. So, ger- bad German intelligence. Well, it's true. It was. We can really characterise it as terrible. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just you, the problem you've got is you've got a totalitarian military state, which is run by kind of Hitler and, and Goering and Co. And they very much fall into the kind of divide and rule kind of strategy of yeah. of ruling. Um, and, and what that basically means is you have lots of parallel command structures all over the place. Or competing, in direct or, competition. Which are in competing because, you know, intelligence is power. And if it's important to kind of keep your position you've got to use that power to your advantage which means you tend to hold on to that information so the only time that intelligence really starts to come together is at the very top whereas in the allied way actually you know we've now put a huge amount of emphasis on the kind of amazing work that was going on at Bletchley Park and quite rightly so but the important about allied intelligence is is the individual parts add up to much more than uh no I've got that the wrong way around you know what I mean What's the phrase? The sum of the so individual the, parts. The, the, no, the sum is greater than the, the sum of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah anyway, yeah, that yeah. one. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that one. So basically, collectively, all it, those it different all units. Be, it can't all be gold, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> 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 but that's the problem. You know, so that's where um, Allied intelligence really works because yeah. you, it's not just Bletchley Park. What's it's the, not just cryptanalysis. It's, it's the it's the Y service, which is the radio listening yeah. service. It is uh, photo reconnaissance. It is the fact that you've got um, air intelligence, and techie, naval intelligence. Techie. I mean, the thing David yeah. told us about, uh, uh, David Willey told us at Bovington about how. They, the tanks they captured in Tunisia, they could pull them apart and look at the serial numbers, figure out what the serial numbers meant, figure out where stuff was being made. You know that level of yep. that level of thinking. Yeah. Um, rather than maybe having to press the tank into service on the Russian front, which is what the, <laughs> the German equivalent would be. Collectively, it adds up to more than the sum of its individual parts. He got there in the end. <laughs> 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 but I mean, they did get a, they did get a break now and again. The Germans, because in the North African campaign, at one point, was very very leaky, yes. wasn't it? And the, the Germans had a, 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 they got into the a, a, um, the American defense attaché in Italy that's right, yeah, before he came into the yeah. war. Yeah, that's right. And and he would basically he'd be merrily writing home, going, "God damn, you won't believe what the Brits are going to do this week." And <laughs> yeah. the, and the, and someone was basically, oh, damn, they got three hundred Germans exactly. And the, and 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 someone in the Italian uh, embassy. He was simply relaying all that to the Germans, and they knew they knew that. Well, you know, and every now and again they'd get lucky; they'd get a source, and and they'd they'd get fresh news directly from the Allied HQ in in Alexandria. But that eventually dried up, didn't it? And Rommel yeah. Rommel Rommel ran out of road intelligence wise. I mean, you you know, the intelligence around the Battle of Britain is famously bad, awful, famously. Awful. But but then you only you know you, the fact that Rudolf Hess thought that um, he could fly to Scotland and which Duke was it? The, the, Hamilton. Who, yeah, Duke, exactly. And that he would be able to speak to him and that that's who ran the government. You know, it's just most, <laughs> most of the way the Germans viewed how Britain worked was... was or the German, the Nazis video. It was sort of crazy. But but Hess acid, was supposed to be a bit acid thick, tinged, wasn't he? Well, yeah, but 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 right at the heart of things. So yeah, you yeah, know, true. you surely could have asked. 
yeah. someone who what knew. I always find absolutely amazing is that Goering, from the very you know from the mid nineteen thirties right through to the very end of the end of his days, has his own private intelligence service, yeah. which is called the Forschungsamt, yeah. which is you know which Hitler knows about. And, you know, this is for keeping tabs on his enemies because his enemies yeah. aren't the British or the Americans or the Soviets. No, it's the other, it's it's other, the Nazis. other Nazis. Yeah, yeah. And basically it's a wiretapping service, which he then expands, and it is his own personal intelligence service. Yeah. And this is why he's still in power and in authority, yeah. you know, right up to the very end. Yeah. Amazing. Poor old Canaris in the Abwehr trying to do it properly. And Yeah, sorry, Chum, it doesn't work like that anymore. <laughs> right. Tempo... It's the piano wire for you. <laughs> Tempo para uma pausa which is Portuguese for time for a break, but with a Spanish accent. <laughs> That's nicely bookending this first half of the show. We'll be back in um minuto. <laughs> uh, welcome back. Uh, you're listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk, uh, the Second World War podcast for people who like podcasts about the Second World War. Now, James, we've had a number <laughs> of people get in touch and ask us about the raid on Dieppe, uh, which we casually mentioned a few shows ago without providing any real context. Big D 1974 asks an in interesting question, which I think is a good starting point to talk about in a bit more de detail. Was the Dieppe raid a practice run for D-Day, and what did the Allied forces learn from it? It wasn't really, was it? It wasn't really a practice run, no. Um, what they were trying to do was kind of sort of just test just how how strong the Atlantic Wall defences were. It, it was considered a raid, but it was a very big raid. So big numbers, mostly Canadian troops. There were some US Army Rangers actually involved in yeah. that as well. The first time the Rangers went into action, European soul. Huge numbers of aircraft as well, Allied Air Forces supporting it. Um, and uh, it didn't get very far at all. I mean, you know, they... They encountered all sorts of problems. One of the reasons why was because there was a huge amount of pressure to 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 make a big raid on do something to do something because uh, what happened in May 1942 um, was that Molotov, who was the uh, Soviet foreign foreign uh, minister, came over to first to London and then to to uh, Washington. And when he came over to London, he said, look, it's absolutely essential. You know, we know the Germans are going to be attacking this summer. We're quite braced for it. Um, you know, anything you can do to draw off German troops from, from the Eastern Front would be a massive help. You know, you really do need to do something. And the British said, well, you know, it's great, but we can't really mount a, a, a cross-channel invasion this year because we're just not ready for it, having agreed that they would at the Arcadia Conference in December 1942, yeah, yeah, yeah. 41. But that was to kind of make sure that the Americans said, yeah, OK, we'll do a Germany first policy, which they did. The Americans were kind of much more gung-ho, but you've got to remember the Americans were very green to war at this point of view in the kind yeah. of new war. So then Molotov goes over to Washington, sees George Marshall, who's the chief of staff of the US Army, and then Roosevelt, and says, you know, exactly the same thing. And both Marshall and Roosevelt go, yeah, no problem at all. Yeah, absolutely we're doing that. And so they're kind of sort of slightly honour-bound to do this. And, you know, this is where the whole kind of invading North Africa comes from, because actually what Churchill says, well, look, you can go into North Africa, you're taking on German troops, and, you know, you're fulfilling that promise. You can kind of test your army, a bit yeah. green, you know, can find out what we need to do wrong you know we'll go you know what's going wrong we can get right we can use it as a kind of test exercise we can also kind of you know do a massive amphibious invasion and, and test all that and how that works and everything against a pretty soft opposition what's not to like and you know it's hard to argue with any of that and roosevelt yeah. to his credit goes yeah absolutely nothing yeah. let's go for it um, and so that's why that that develops but in the meantime is a kind of sort of a kind of halfway house which is the which is the diet rate which is initially conceived by combined operations which is kind of commanded by um, Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten at the time, and and it's a kind of it's a testing the water exercise. It's just let's just see what happens if you know we've done commando raids. Let's kind of upscale it and see what happens and test the kit, test the tactics, test the men because you've got you've got you know Lord Lovett um, commando yes. people doing doing sort of flanky stuff, haven't you? Yeah, uh, 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 and and a Churchill tank makes its uh, an early appearance in the war doesn't it um, yeah, and yeah, gets yeah. stuck on the shingle and all that sort of thing um i, I mean it's it, it it it's it's very controversial though Dieppe, isn't it because yes. because it goes it, it 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 goes very badly although it would be hard to argue it would be hard to determine what going well would have amounted to for the Dieppe raid if if you, if you see what i mean because what's actually the objective to hold seas and hold Dieppe? Hold until relieved? No, not really. No, it's, it's not. Sort of, it's sort of land on the beach, tool around on the beach a bit, smash the town up, and then 
probably bugger off. I mean, it, it, it's it's quite it's quite hard to pin down what the sort of um, what the long term point of Dieppe is. So you so it's not a practice run for D Day. It's it's just a sort of a something else. And the raids all fall into this idea of it, it's a something else. But it, they certainly learn a, a massive amount from it. And f- um, when you're talking about, you know, uh, uh, in, in, the, the Allied invasion of Europe in, in, in 1944, when you're talking about Overlord, when you're talking about D-Day, Dieppe is incredibly important and, and a, a massive set of lessons on offer. Don't attack a port. Um, make sure you know what the beach what the beach is like to drive a tank up. Yeah. You know, uh, all that really, really crucial stuff and how you make your combined arms work and and you need air su- you need air supremacy, not even air superiority. You need... Yep. Uh, and that's per- total control of skies. T- and, and also, this is one of the things Normandy is, is not just, it's not just control of the skies over the invasion beaches or where you're landing or where you're... Control of the skies everywhere. It's, yeah, way it's, inland. It's, 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 yes, it's complete air supremacy. Which Because, because of course, after the Battle of Britain, you get this thing with the RAF... Um, in 1941 for the sort of spring season. They've got to do something, haven't they? So they do, they, they do these sort of big wing flights over France. Yeah, it's and, completely pointless. And, totally pointless. Waste of pilots, waste of kit, waste of men, waste, waste of morale. Should have those of Malta. T- totally stupid. And Middle but, East. But, but, but falls into the, we've got to do something. We've got to put on a show of force. We've got to make it look like we're, there's even a, a war being fought. I mean, this is a legacy of phony war as well. Where you've... you've You've, you've, you know, six months, eight months, whatever it is, of absolutely bugger all happening and, and, it, and it seeping into the entire prosecution of the war, seeping into public morale, seeping into military morale, that the people think, oh, what's the point? We're at war, we're not fighting, what's the point? The government's incompetent, all that sort of thing. So there's, there's all these things in the mix, yeah. mix and political pressure from Russia. So that, but, but, but you do wonder, you know, Dieppe goes badly, yeah. San Nazaire is sort of comparable, where there is a there's an end goal. Yep. You, you you've gone there to to smash the place up. You've gone there to destroy the docks. You've gone there to to do a to do a job. Yep. Dieppe is kind of like, well, we'll turn up, we'll land some tanks. I mean, it, it, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. It's kind yeah. of it's, it's, it's kind, kind of, of it's, weird feel, for that quality. Yeah, and it's one of those ones where the kind of sort of political drive towards it is kind of has outweighed kind of military logic. I think. And why the why the Canadians? Is it because Canadians haven't done anything yet? Yeah, because the Canadians have been there since 1940, and they're kind of sitting there twiddling their thumbs, and they sort of go, "Well, you know, we'll have a crack," you know, yeah. and um, um, and you know, they kind and, of effectively volunteer themselves. And, yeah, and the Canadian Army at home is politically controversial anyway, yep. which we'll talk about another time. When, yes. when you've read that bloody book. Anyway. The- <laughs> oh, the Jonathan Van Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of stuff about the zombie mutiny, which we'll get to. But yes, so you learned, and the, the, Dieppe offered an awful lot of lessons, but it's also this, it's a curate egg, isn't it, really, yeah. uh, of 1942, of, 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 of uh, you can argue that it's a massive success in terms of uh, what you learn from it, but it's, Blatantly a failure. It's a, it's a, well, it's like, you know, 4,000 casualties, yeah. you know, I mean, just, just gone just like that. And I think yeah. the RAF do something like 100 aircraft. I mean, yeah. it's a, you know, these yeah, are not, proper cock not, fiasco. not slight. Yeah, it's a fiasco. And it sort of underlines, you know, it's one, it's one of the reasons why they don't go in in 1943 yeah. as well, when actually it possibly could have done if they'd gone in, in Normandy, but they're kind of completely scared off by this. They go, you know, right, you know, if we're going to go onto the continent, we're going to do this properly, boys. We're yeah. not going to do any halfway house anymore. You know, we can have the odd commando raid, that's fine. But from now on, this has got to be big scale, big war, properly prosecuted with all our ducks in a row. And... and- and it's interesting because originally it's hammer and anvil, isn't it? You know, the, the North France is, Northern France is going to be hammer, anvil, Southern France. And the names sort of, the names change from these sort of gung-ho American names to Overlord. It was uh, Sledgehammer, yeah. It was Sledgehammer, that's oh. right, yeah, and anvil. Says the, the, names, the names sort of change into, like, and Overlord very much, I think, is an expression of what you've just said. We're going to do this on a, on a huge scale yeah. where there's nothing, they, nothing the Germans can do about this, the scale of what we're doing, what we're bringing to bear. And well, Anvil becomes Anvil, Dragoon. And, and Anvil becomes Dragoon, which is, again, a different thing. Right. Um, uh, oh, right. Yes. Well, that's one thing they didn't have on the Dieppe raid. No. Was your next, uh, our, our this week's artefact, our thing. Our thing. Our uh, mystery two, thing. It, they're noises, but I can't hold it near the microphone. You know what this is. I know what this is. Anyone who's been on holiday in Normandy knows what this is because they're in they're sort of in giant bowls on the hotel reception wherever yeah, you Yeah, and what you absolutely mustn't do is let a kid go anywhere near them. Oh, Jesus Christ, no. I, I went no. with a bunch of school kids once over. With my son's, my son's school, we went over on a coach load. And um, the headmaster said, look, chaps, I bought you one of these. And I said, no! no! So literally for the next three days, he 
Clicking, yeah, when I took clicking. my daughters to Normandy, I mean, it's quite a while ago now, I did not let them buy them. No, you can't. You they're, absolutely they're, can't. They're adult-only yeah, toys. Yeah, adult-only adult toy. But what it is, and this is a, I mean, this is a, a famous, this is, the, this is one from a hotel as well. This is, the, you know, has D-Day on it, written on it, 6 June 1944, 6 juin, Milneuf, oh, je je forget je. it, 14, <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, uh, and this is that. This is the tourist hotel version. But these were these. This famous clicker because it features in the longest day and, and in a stupidly goofy scene in the longest day. Um, these are for hundred. It was hundred for the first airborne. Got given these. Eighty second didn't. I don't think. Oh. And it wasn't everyone, was it? Oh, I thought it was eighty second as well. Uh, but maybe. you may no. I, I, maybe. I defer to what I know. No, 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 I may be, no. I may be wrong. But the idea with this was, you've dropped in the middle of the night. It's night. It's night. You, you don't buy know a hedgerow. Where, you buy a hedgerow. You're probably on your own. You don't know where you are. Maybe your stick got separated and blah, 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 blah. And so to f- identify friend or foe, you do that and they click back twice. That's right. Whereas Bridget just go ham and jam. Ham and jam. Ham and jam. Ham and jam. But, but, the, but the, the, this is, the, I mean, this, what's interesting about this is it sort of says, and, and we've talked about this a lot, that they've really tried to think about absolutely absolutely everything that they've tried to go right burrow right down into what all the possible problems are i mean this isn't a legacy of dieppe necessarily but it's a legacy of the thinking that then goes into how do we make this invasion work what are the problems we're going to face you know uh, because dropping airborne soldiers at night is a thing that they've decided they've got to do um it's incredibly difficult um, uh, very dangerous. My father said the scariest parachute jumps he ever did were in his biological suit at night. Right. Where you can't see out the thing and you can't see, right? Uh, 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 you know, and you're supposed to judge when you're going to land. Right? And, and this is, and that wasn't, that was him doing it, training, not, not sure. for real. So you've got this very, very, you, th- th- they devise a thing like this that will go in your pocket. Is is fascinating. I don't know how reliable they were or how useful they were. There are mixed reports about the utility, but I think as a sort of eye-catching way of thinking, of exemplifying how the Allied thinking goes all the way down to a thing in the guy's pocket, it's really fascinating. Yeah, it really is. It is. Uh, they're amazing little things, and, and like a lot of the best inventions, they're really super simple. Yeah, yeah. I was two bi- two bits of metal. Yep. And you squeeze it, and then annoy everyone. And then annoy everyone. It's- Sort of, you know, it's quite annoying, isn't it? <laughs> it's really annoying. Yeah, I'll put it down. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Anyway, are we doing right. any more or is no, that, have we got no, to the no, end? No. Just uh, before we... we go. Oh, that's a shame. Just before we go. I'll do it one more time. A quick <laughs> reminder that we're actually going to record a live version of the podcast. We're going to have like a light show, uh, pyrotechnics. Um, uh, I'm gonna, yeah, an ego ramp. I'm going to run down an ego ramp. <laughs> while I'm a 25 pounders. Exactly, firing. exactly. I've got a 90 uh, millimeter anti tank gun, especially coming to Chortwell Hills Festival. Super. Only one in the UK. And that's where we're doing the live um, podcast at the Chalk Valley History Festival on Saturday, June the 29th at midday. We'll be standing on our Jimmy, our two and a half ton GMC. Fantastic. American um, truck. Um, uh, a, a, a brief summary of the Chalk Valley history. Festival. Yeah, it's, it's slightly eccentric, really. It's a kind of mixture of kind of talks and debates and discussions, but all the kind of stuff you'd expect from an English summer festival in the middle of the countryside. Beautiful countryside, um, lots and lots of um, living history as well. And we're going pretty big on D Day seventy five. We've got yeah. a massive four times size Hawker Typhoon yes. that we're building, yeah. putting on a hill. Um, we've got a Second World War trench. We've got uh, all sorts of stuff, tanks. Yeah, um, uh, Dick and for a, Victory Garden, Anderson Shelter, excellent fireworks, D Day, darlings, June twenty fourth to the thirtieth. Yes, those are the dates. Yeah, um, schools festival near near Wilton. Near, yeah, near, we've near got Salisbury. veterans coming. We've got all sorts of stuff. Brilliant. Well, uh, get in touch with James and I using the hashtag We Have Ways on Twitter or We Have Ways Podcast at Gmail dot com if you're old. Um, <laughs> uh, that's the email for old people. Uh, see you next time. Yep. Cheerio.